Um, I have uh, an, a, a list of folk who have agreed to share with uh, all of us uh, a few minutes of their uh, personal reflections on their learning of Yirmiyahu. Oh, excuse me, that's Sky News telling me something I don't want to know. Um, so, and I don't know how to turn it off. Okay, so um, this is not going to be in any particular order, uh, except the order that Shoshana wrote it in, which had no... Uh, uh, okay, so I'm going to ask each of the per people who have agreed to... Uh, to, to share their thoughts, to come and sit over here so that the people on Zoom and the people on the recording can hear uh, what you've got to say uh, and uh, share with us your thoughts. So I'm going to start with Ronnie Phillips, please. Um, yeah, anybody who's not on the list that would like to do so, um, you can stick your hand up in a little while. I think we will have time, hopefully because uh, we're doing fine at the moment for, for time uh, and we'll hear as many of you as as you would like to to do that okay Ronnie, there you are have a seat okay. over there thank you so if you can, much if you can see yourself on that square there then people can see you um and hopefully they'll be able to hear you as well Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to say just a few words, and please time me out after five minutes, because it's not too long, but it's very fascinating, chapter 35. Now, as Karen has just said, uh, Yuma Yahoo is not in chronological order, and actually 35 follows after 34. And chapter 34 is in the reign of Zedki Yahoo. I think they, how, how you pronounce it but chapter 35 actually jumps back about 10 years to the reign of king yeho yakin um and it was obviously in the work in, the, in, the, in within the first four years because i think yemaya who gets thrust into jail after about four years of that of that reign and it's actually a fascinating chapter, and I'm, I keep thinking about it, and I don't know the answer to it. So basically, you know, very, very quickly, um, Hashem says to Yirmiyahu that he should uh, go to the Rechavim or the Rechavites, who actually um, descended uh, from Yisrael, and he should take them into the base of Migdosh. Interesting thing is Yirmiyahu is obviously allowed access to the base of Migdosh, to a chamber, to a designated chamber, and they have to go into the chamber, these Rechavites, Rechavim, and they have to drink wine. We're not actually told, told why. And basically what happens is that um, that uh, they say to him, no, we are not going to drink wine because our great-grandfather, um, who was called Yechonadab, who was the son of Rechab, their ancestor, the great-great-great-grandfather, the great, great -grandfather, told them not to drink wine. And it wasn't just as simple as that, not drinking wine. They're to, they were to be nomads not to live in houses, live in tents, and live what we might say these days, a sort of hippie type of life, because if you don't live in houses, you don't drink wine, then you cut yourself off from society in a way. And the interesting thing, you, you might have thought, well, Yuma Yahoo might say, well, this is entirely wrong, because if Hashem says, you, you know, says to Yuma Yahoo, you need to go and drink wine, then it's very wrong not to drink wine. But in fact, it was quite the reverse. Because what Yirmiyahu said that to them, listen, is that you have you have listened to your, your great great grandfather, you're following his mitzvahs, mitzvah exactly, but he's saying to the people, look, look, you are not listening to your father in heaven, a Kodesh Baruchu. And because you are not listening to your father, Yirmiyahu, so, so so basically the Babylonians are going to take over, Nechabagnezer is going to is going to take you over 
and and rule. And that is basically the gist of, of, of chapter 35. And I've actually listened and not, not only you know read this several times, but for, but listen to a shear by Rabbi Livtak on Nah uh, OU that that was recommended to us. Now the interesting thing here is that basically is you know what should we do? The whole point is that the, one of the the ancestors of these Rechabites. Um, was act, would actually work with Yehu in the time of King um, Ahab or Ahab and basically destroyed all the people, all the bad people, all the descendants of, of Ahab. The difficulty was there that after all that destruction, after they, they had gone in, they killed so many people, the people did not repent. They still followed idols and they went back to their to the evil way. So that's something, you know, I just think, you know, one's, one's going to learn. It's all very well doing things, you know, you're killing all this, but how are you going to mend your ways after that? And and so the, the, the promise, the the, the the upshot was that, that, that Yemiyahu said, that Hashem said, because they heeded the mitzvah of their ancestor, Yechonadab, and you've kept the commandments, therefore you won't be cut off from Yechonadab, the son of um, Rachab's descendants, and therefore they were, going to, they were going to be kept, you know, quite spiritual in their own way. They had to go to Yerushalayim. They couldn't live in tents because Nebuchadnezzar took over. So the whole point is, because they followed very strictly, they they were they had a promise for a Kodesh Baruch Hu, but the reverse was that the people didn't listen to Yirmiyahu, and therefore I, 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 there was going to be a bad outcome. So the question is, you know, you know what we should, it's all very well having houses, drinking wine, but unless you can make brochures, you, you 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 can treat all this in a holy way, then obviously we're not going to s s succeed. And that's the lesson that I take from it. I'm not sure if I'm right. I'd be interested to to, to know what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. I think what we took away from that, if we had to do it in one sentence, would be that the sons of Yonadav. The family of Yonadav listened to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, despite the fact that they were uh, told to drink wine. They didn't do so. And if you look at the last pasuk of the chapter, it says uh, very clearly. Um, the, the last pasuk of that chapter says, um, "Because you listened, um, then you'll be okay." Um, which is a contrast, so of course, to to Bnei Israel uh, and they who, who they didn't. Uh, and he says, yeah, so he says, and to the family of the Rechabites, has said, God, because you have obeyed the charge of your ancestor, Yonadav, and kept all his commandments and all, all that he uh, enjoined upon you, assuredly, said God, the God of Israel, there shall never cease to be someone from the line of Yonadav ben Rechav standing before me. So, uh, it, well, I'll tell you where they are now. Very interesting. You should say that, Paul. And, uh, and because and it's really interesting that Ronnie brought this up. There's a chap, I haven't got time to go into it now because it's not, it, it's too complicated. But there's a guy who um, is the most amazing fellow who had a real latter day yitro. He had he started off life as a, 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 a from uh, Catholic, then tried all sorts of different things, wasn't interested in the Trinity. Eventually, he came to a Judaism. And he converted to Judaism with his entire family. His two daughters are now in Sem in Yerushalayim. Uh, amazing, amazing family. Uh, one day I'll tell you the whole story because it's, it's an amazing story. And when he was Magai, which was about two years ago now, what name did he choose? Yonadav. He's the only Yonadav that I know. Anybody else here knows anybody called Yonadav? No, it's not a common name. He chose the name Yonadav uh, because... Uh, because he was a, 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 a descendant of Yitro, uh, who had tried all the religions, he turned, and because of this pasuk here that you quoted, Ronnie. And one day, uh, when we've got time, I'll tell you the story about this Yonadav and his family, because it is just jaw-dropping, but it's not for now. Okay, so thank you very much for that, Ronnie. I have to go back to my uh, list now. Where are we? Um, who's next on the list, Shoshana? Uh, Deborah Lasko. 
Just in time. Just in time. Okay, into the hot seat, Deborah, and you have five five or so minutes to tell us about what you've learned from you, Miyahu. Okay, well, from my student, I'm You have to sit over here. Yeah, because you have to, to let them on the camera. Everyone has to see you. I'm recording for You're being recorded. You're being watched. You're being listened to. Everything. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so um, I'm I'm a real simpleton here. I've, I've just... This is my first six school. I'm just learning how to, to, to learn Tanakh here. And Yemiyahu is a great one to start out with. Um, well, so for me, just studying this and learning this, uh, I think what really struck me the most, I've got pair 12 and 13. And what really strikes me while I'm reading through all this is, is just how relevant it is to what we're going through today. Um, and that the question that, you know, here we have our history that just seems to be repeating, repeating, repeating uh, of us, you know, you know, believing the leaders, following the leaders, not following the leaders, um, and never knowing really quite who, who, you know, who to believe. Where, where's, where's your true faith? Where's your true faith upon? And, and knowing who is speaking the truth as, as our, our people are going through such a challenge. Um, and, and there's one line in here that, that really struck me. Um, well, there's two, but one is um, where Hashem is saying to, I think he's saying to Yermiyahu, huh? Um, every wine jug should be filled with wine. And I think he's re the analogy is he's referring to the Jewish people. And that's the, the only way out of anything really seems to be that, that Jews, we just have to be our true authentic self and not, not look to others. Um, to explain ourselves, but to just be who we know we're supposed to be. And that is to have that deep connection with Hashem. And that deep connection uh, with Hashem is actually through each of us, one another, united, um, being kind, being helpful. And um, that's, I'm, that's all I'm going to share. I've had five minutes. <laughs> so your, your message is we all have to be together. Thanks. And authentic. Yeah, and it, it you know, it's just there's another line in here about how things just get darker and darker, and it's true. It seems like, and I've been watching this since since Corona broke out, that things just keep getting darker and darker. And what it does in the meantime is it's waking up different people, uh, and, and more people. Uh, there's there's a there's something moving forward here. So this darkness is going to lead to light, and uh, that darkness will probably be shorter if we all just turn to the light. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is David. David Bernstein. Hot seat. Hot seat. See myself. If you can see yourself, they can see you. All right. Well, first, I want to thank uh, Shoshana for organizing this and to thank Karen for her. What is this? What do you mean? I turned it off. I don't know what it's doing. Yeah. <laughs> turned it off. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Karen for her amazing talk, but also for the handout, because uh, it really uh, helps. A few of, thank you. A few of the things that I wanted to say in the five minutes. So I had Nina and I took chapters one and two. And uh, my question to you was, how many of you have seen Rembrandt's Jeremiah? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, in truth, I think it was Shoshana who organized the talk a number of months ago about Rembrandt, who brought unbelievable. I, I, if that's recorded, I highly recommend. But uh, anyways, the original, how many have seen? I believe it's in Amsterdam. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, anyways, it's a small painting, approximately 18 by 22 inches. And in it, Rembrandt brilliantly captures the weathered, beaten Ermiyahu, all alone in a cave with his downcast eyes in dreadful contemplation as he's mourning, internalizing the severe pain and suffering of his people. I don't think I'd be exaggerating if I dare say that as soon as we began even fathoming what happened on October 7th to our country, to our people, to our brothers and sisters, women, men, Holocaust survivors, infants, 
I think all of us can definitely, and I can definitely speak for my uh, for myself, have had many moments and still do, where we feel like we could be the ones sitting in front of Rembrandt and being a perfect subject for him to paint for that very same painting. And so Emiel and Avi certainly lived through very, very challenging times. And uh, he was charged with a very difficult task of defiantly proclaiming Hashem's world, uh, word, as I urge you to see Rabbi Johnny's beautiful shiur from Sunday, all about social justice. The orphan, the poor, the widow. But in the next five minutes or so, that uh, Shoshana has asked many of us to, to speak, I'd like to share with you our reflections. How learning Irmiyahu actually gave Nina and I, and hopefully all of us, tremendous hope in Chizuk by realizing that during difficult times, we are connected, we're not alone. So first of all, what connects us is Dvar Hashem. The word of God. Where is it written? Of course, in the Torah. And I looked at uh, Karen's uh, uh, reproduction of the painting. I don't think you can see it there. But can any of you remember, what is your Miyahu in this pose? What is he leaning on? Can you tell? A skull? I don't think so. It's a book. Yes, it's actually the Bible. It's the Torah. And the very same Tanakh that we're all learning here and that we're making a siyum on tonight. And I'm so proud to feel that special connection with each and every one of you and with people all over the world learning Tanakh through Matan. We're not alone. We're a very important link and a very important chain of all the other Matan communities in this case, together with whom we're completing this book, the Tanakh. A second reflection is location. And again, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Could you please all turn <laughs> to uh, the first pasuk? Divrei Irmiyahu ben Chilkiyahu mina koanim asher location ba'anatot ba'eretz binyamin. Where is Irmiyahu starting? In Anatot, right? In Anatot, Be'eretz Binyamin. So I'll tell you a personal story. The very first time that Nina and I came to visit our daughter and our children in Ma'ale Adumim, we were standing on their beautiful Mirpeset, and our grandson was then around eight years old. And he says, Saba, look at that. You see that hill over there? Somewhere just around there is where Miao and Avi walked. I think that place is called Anatot. So we feel the connection to the land where we can point our finger many times to locations where our prophets actually walked. And we know that in that very spot, it is now us that are walking, living, and writing new pages in the history of our people. And finally, a third reflection about our connection again, this time to generations, past and future. Dor le dor, Yeshabach Ma'asecha. Starting from the very inception of our nation, in chapter two, which we learn verse two, Yirmiyahu tells us, Ko amar Hashem, zachalti lach chesed neuraich, ahavat klulotaich. So said Hashem, I remember, the loving kindness of your youth, the love of our very wedding day. And henceforth, when you followed me blindly, followed me with full faith to the de in the desert, our link in this very special chain of Jewish history. And so tells us here, Miyahu, you are not alone. Your very special link, your connection to every Jew around the world, through the book, the Torah, through Eretz Yisrael, through Jewish history. This link will always be your source of chizuk and your strength. How is that? Well, we all bench 
after we have a meal with bread. And we say a pasuk that gives us great chizuk. We may not have realized that it comes from, yes, from Yirmiyahu. I believe it's chapter 17, pasuk 7, where he says, Baruch HaGever, Tach Ba'ashem, Ve'haya Hashem Yiftacho. Blessed is the person who puts their faith and trust in Hashem. And so that was the beginning of our people in the Midbar. But the Yirmiyahu also tells us that we will soon, very soon, be celebrating together another pasuk from Yirmiyahu that we all know by heart. Odi Shama Be'arei Yehuda of Chutzot Yerushalayim. Kol Sasson Ve'kol Simcha. Kol Chatan Ve'kol Kala. Bimer Abi Amen. Okay, without that, what are we? Thank you. David mentioned uh, David mentioned the location there of uh, Anatot. As um, Hashem, at the the end of this, I'm going to tell you about another amazing location connection to uh, to say for Yirmiyahu, um, and we'll speak about that. Uh, uh, at the end. Uh, next uh, up is Sharon. Uh, Sharon Steele. Who's going to sing it for us now? <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk about chapter 42. So in summary, chapter 42 of Yahu deals with a, a request by the Jewish people um, to Yerimiyahu to pray for guidance about whether the Jewish people should stay in the land of Judah under the rule of the Babylonians or move to seek refuge in Egypt. And I noted three points of particular interest to me. So in verses two, three and five, the people asked Jeremiah to pray to your God, Elochecha, if you look in the text, in the singular. So this reminds me of the Rasha, or the wicked son, um, in our Seder service. It appears to denote a scepticism or an insincerity amongst the people about asking God for an answer to their dilemma. Yet in verse 6, the text refers to Eloheinu, to our God, with no obvious explanation for the switch um, in possessive article. Following Jeremiah's prayers on behalf of the people, my second point of interest relates to why there was a period of 10 days before Jeremiah received a prophecy to address the question of whether to stay or whether to move down to Egypt. During the Aseret Yomei Teshuvah, we are expected to return to Hashem and develop our spiritual relationship with him in order to seal our fate in the coming year. Doing this sincerely requires preparation and time. Is there something that we can learn from Pasuk 7 in chapter 42 about the importance of adequate time and preparation to ensure that we are, re we are receptive to spiritual direction, more especially if the answers we receive are not what we want to hear? My final point relates to verses 20 and 21. Why do the people bother to ask for direction from God when they promptly ignored the answer given? The writing to me was clearly on the wall from the people's insincerity in referring to God in the third person, Elochecha, uh, implying it was Jeremiah's God in the early verses in the chapter that I've already spoken about. Why go through the charade of asking for advice and then totally ignoring it? So what can we learn? Firstly, the people are wavering about whose God it is. Secondly, there was a significant time delay in receiving an answer to their very important strategic question. And lastly, ultimately, the people asked for advice and they completely ignored it. In conclusion, I heard a wonderful insight about leadership at the Shiva for one of our dear Chayalim who tragically fell in battle at the beginning of this war. I think it helps me to make sense of my learning and the ultimate success of Yeramiyahu. 
In paying tribute to this exceptional soldier, a highly experienced commander of combat troops suggested that true leaders change people for the better. This is a perspective I've never thought about before, but it's been on my mind almost daily since I heard it. Although in chapter 42, there is clearly minimal evidence that Jeremiah changed people for the better, we know that by the end of his book, the people finally derive hope from his teachings. So in my mind, despite numerous trials and tribulations along the way, Yeremiahu passed our modern day commander's test of leadership. Yeremiahu ultimately succeeded in changing people for the better through his sustained spirituality and perseverance over time, despite the challenges. Developing this attribute of leadership to change people for the better requires integrity and self-development over a prolonged period of time. We need these leadership skills as much today as ever, and hence the example of Yeremiahu stands the test of time. Paul, Paul Good evening. 51 and 52 was the uh, chapters that Diane and I took, which are the last two chapters in the book. So the first thing we learned was that there are 52 chapters in Jeremiah. <laughs> Um, and obviously it's, it's coming towards the, the end of um, Jeremiah's prophecies. And in fact, chapter 51 is really mostly talking about what's going to happen to Babylon. Because for much of, the, much of his book, he's been talking about what's going to happen to the Jewish people. Then he talks about what's going to happen to Egypt. And then for good measure, um, he talks about what's going to happen to Babylon, uh, because we don't want to think that the fact that Babylon was able to destroy the temple doesn't mean that Babylon was a better place. They get their own comeuppance a bit later on. So, if, in fact, starting from the previous chapter um, in, in number 50, he, took, he starts talking about a prophecy about Babylon. I'm just looking at the summary in this, in this Tanakh. And then a few verses later, another prophecy about Babylon. And then quite a few verses later, another prophecy about Babylon. And a few verses later, another prophecy about Babylon. Um, and it's horrific. He goes into great detail about what is going to happen, how they're going to be completely destroyed in, in, in the, within the coming years. Um, so I suppose that helped. It does. Does it really help if you know you're going to be destroyed? The fact that your enemy will in due course be destroyed as well. I'm not sure if that gives you uh, any strength, but um, <laughs> that's what uh, that's what he says. Now, a couple of small things I just wanted to talk about. Are any of you um, currently learning the book of Daniel? There's a few of you. So last week. Um, I happen to be listening to the Shia, um, and the discussion was about, as uh, Sharon, you beautifully introduced us to it without completely unwittingly when you said the writing's on the wall. Because in the book of Daniel, we have the writing is on the wall. And the writing, on the, another picture by Rembrandt, recommend that you have a look at that picture. He has the words, the Hebrew words. Um, and they don't make sense. Don't make sense. And it's it, it, it's a code. It's just it's, the commentaries tell us it's a code. And the code is that you take the first letter Aleph and you substitute it for the last letter Tough. Then you take Bet and the one from the end. So all the letters are reversed, and that then makes sense of the writing on the wall. Why am I talking about that? Because here at the beginning of chapter fifty-one. It says, 
God says, look, I'm stirring up a destructive wind against Babylon and the inhabitants of Lev Kamai. What's Lev Kamai? It's no one knows who Lev Kamai is. However, if you do, um, if you adopt that code and change the letters round, it turns in to the Hebrew word for Babylon, for Chaldean, the Chaldi, I think it is. Um, and that's a very interesting little connection that, that we we learnt ourselves. So we come to the end of 51, all about Babylon being destroyed. Very, very destroyed. And he ends up, he, he instructs his scribe, who um, is in fact the brother of the original scribe that he had, he instructed Sariah to write all this down in a scroll. And the words end with the, as they began in chapter one, up to here are the words of Jeremiah. So what about chapter 52? Because that's not the words of Jeremiah, because they're finished at the end of chapter 51. So chapter, I can, you can imagine, you've got the whole book, 51 chapters. And then you, you'll say, well, this is all his prophecies. What's actually going to happen? Don't just leave us in the lurch. We need to know. And although it is mentioned in the middle of the book, here in chapter, in chapter 52, the last book, we go into great detail um, about the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, it goes into terrible detail. And of course, again, everyone's mentioned connections. If you read chapter 52, you will understand where our horrendous enemy were able to get their ideas on that horrible day of October the 7th, because it talks about burning, talks about mass killing. It talks even about poking, take, poking out eyes. Um, and it's, it's all there. It's just carried straight through. They destroyed the temple. They took everything away. Everything is described in great detail. Um, and people were killed, others were exiled, and uh, some of the poorer people, though, were actually left in Israel to carry on um, farming the land. So it wasn't completely terrible. So we need to end up in a, in a reasonable way. We can't just end up in complete straughtness. And we have, and the last few verses, um, we're introduced to, I love this name, King Evil Merodach. In fact, it, that reminds me of Evil, can you very good. <laughs> but it's actually Evil, but it's written down E-V-I-L, Evil King Evil, Evil Merodach um, of Babylon. He was, he's, he came after Nebuchadnezzar, and actually he wasn't quite such a terrible chap because he um, took note and he took a liking to King Jehoiakim, not to be confused to King Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, who just ruled for a short while. I think you mentioned him, someone mentioned him, you know, maybe. Um, Jehoiakim, he'd been in prison. He took a liking to him and he gave him nice clothes. He took him out for supper. He was given a regular food allowance every day for the rest of his life until he died. So we end up with some hope because from that, we know that the Jewish people were actually able to continue. There we go. Thank you. Can I just make a suggestion? Yeah. Let's go onto the Zoom here. We can keep our eye on it. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to enter the Zoom room of the Matan uh, of the Matan um, seal, and we're going to keep our eye on where they're up to. And then when they do the Hadran. <laughs> For Zoom, get into Zoom. Can, can you do two Zooms on one computer? I don't know that you can. With another window? You can't open the program twice. Yeah, you can't open the Zoom program twice, I don't think. So what we will what we'll do is we'll keep our eye 
on uh, on this screen here, and we'll uh, and then when we we come to the Hadran, what we'll do is we will, in fact, we'll do it now. Um, we will. Yeah. Well, you've got it. Um, I think if if those of you who are on Zoom, if you've got the if you go to the link L I N C, if you go to the link group that Shoshana has set up, in there you will find the link L I N K. This is very confusing uh, to the Matan. Um, to the Matan Sium. Um, uh, in the moment, we'll stay with us uh, and we're keeping our eye on them on another screen. When they're ready to do the Hadran, we will tell you and then you can switch links. And after that, you can switch back, um, if you like, for our summary. So that's what we'll do for now. So we'll just keep our eye on that. Shoshana, you carry on on your. Uh... Um... So first of all, nothing is Bimikrah. Nothing is uh, by chance. And somebody was actually supposed to speak uh, between me and Paul, Paul and myself. And uh, it's actually thank you because we, Mark and I, were chapters 49 and 50. And you gave a perfect summary for chapters 50 and 49, which is good because um, when I uh, started learning for my chapter, after learning... 49. I learned for this chapter 39. Um, so that's my disclaimer. And just to show you that we're all having, well, at least I am having complete brain fog because I didn't even realize that <laughs> what I had listened to by Rabbi Lee Tag was not what I was learning. So glad to see you. <laughs> um, so just a disclaimer to the person who actually did uh, chapter 39 and 40. Um, and uh, I'm very happy though that happens because the message of this parak is one of hope and one of light, and we didn't need to go through another chapter of complete uh, despair and destruction. Um, and I learned from David Sabato, Rabbi David Sabato, from uh, the VBM from the Gush for uh, this message. And uh, the messages of connection to the people and to the land are very, very strong in this parak. And we see that Yirmiyahu himself has an absolute love and passion for the people and for our land. Um, and the other very important message that comes through is the idea that we are never alone and that Hashem is always with us, even if we can't see it. Um, and that when we do feel despair, that we are given the tools and the skills to um, find the light and that that guidebook is actually our Torah. And that if we invest the time in Talmud Torah, then we will find the skills for coping and for resilience. So in chapter 40, um, the beginning of the Perek discusses what happened after the Holocaust or the destruction of the Chorban. And it discusses Yirmiyahu's choice to stay in Eretz Yisrael as opposed to going with the people um, to Bavel. And uh, he decides to stay in Eretz Yisrael and he decides to join um, Gedalia. Unfortunately, we all know because we fast on Som Gedalia about uh, how the sad events that evolved with Gedalia and his murder, and that unfortunately that became the last opportunity for our revival in the land um, before the final exile. Um, there's also a contradiction between this uh, retelling of the story and the parak before it, because in the parak before it, um, it seems that Nebuchadnezzar personally ordered Yirmiyahu to be taken from court or from prison to Gedalia himself. Um, and it is also a double description description of the story in an earlier parak. Um, a lot of the Parshan in the commentators tried to unpack this, but um, I didn't think that this was relevant to our um, discussion. Um, so our parak, the message is more about Yirmiyahu's choice to be with the people in the land and the emphasis of his free choice, despite a seemingly better invitation by Nebuchadnezzar to go to Babel and receive his personal supervision. So Yirmiyahu was believed by Nebuchadnezzar that his support for Babel had to do with political motives, but not and not his role as a prophet for, for the Jewish people. 
Yirmiyahu believes there is hope and hope for restoration. And he has a debate with Hashem in one of the Medrashim that they're deciding who should go to Babel and who should stay in Eretz Yisrael. And ultimately, Yirmiyahu tells Hashem, you need to go with the exiles. You need to go with the people to Babel. And I will stay here in Eretz Yisrael. Because as we read in Tehillim, and we've been reading so often in Perak Tzadik Aleph, Imo Anochi B'Tzara, because you need to be with them in their moment of Tzara. And this is the same message that's given to Eov, to Job, when we know that he also personally um, has the, the worst atrocities happen to him on a personal level. And the book never answers the question as to why, but Hashem ultimately in the end does sit with him and he sits with him in his misery. And in, in that comfort gives him a tremendous amount of nechama. And so what we've all talked about tonight is also the complexity of Yirmiyahu as a prophet, a prophet that's trying to protect B'nai Israel, trying to protect the people that he loves with his prediction of destruction. And yet Yirmiyahu is so much wanting to sit with the people in their pain and their grief. And this makes him one of the most tragic characters. But what is so clear and obvious in our parak is that Yirmiyahu is seen as a favorite of Nebuchadnezzar because of his misunderstood loyalty and prophecies of rebuke. And Yirmiyahu's call to be with his people in our land. He ultimately chooses to tie his destiny and his free will with the destiny of our people and the destiny of our land he so loved. We question sometimes why Hashem chose us as his people and we are an Am Kshe Oref. And maybe that is for a bracha because we are destined to face hardships, as I said in the beginning, but we've been given the skills and the tools to overcome, to survive, to look forward and to rebuild. We may never have the answer to the whys, but we have the skill set to determine for what has this happened and how do I take the agency and rebuild with hope?